Good morning, everybody. It's Friday, May 31st, 527 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are higher this morning. Matt Bennett is joining us. Guys, let's start off with the uh, drought monitor. So USDA released weekly drought monitor data yesterday. The majority of the Corn Belt received above normal rainfall over the last week. Drought conditions improved in north central and southeast Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, and southern Missouri. Conditions also improved across the eastern regions of Iowa. A large portion of the High Plains also received precipitation. The rainfall helped prevent further development of drought conditions, but did little to improve existing drought levels. We did see conditions improve in northeastern North Dakota and western Nebraska. Uh, however, drought conditions worsened in western and central Kansas and in western Oklahoma. When we look at the percentage of U.S. areas experiencing drought, corn country, 5%, soybeans, 3%, winter wheat, 25%, spring wheat, 3%, and cattle country, 12%. Drought's gone. The Corn Belt drought is over. Uh, here's a side-by-side. -side. I threw this one. And this is, is the current week on the right, and then that's April 2nd on the left. So over the last, uh, call it two months, the drought that had very much uh, impacted Iowa and northern Missouri and Minnesota, um, it's over. It's gone. You've still got some drought in Kansas and uh, places like that. But for the most part, Matt, I mean, it's, it's not a story anymore. No, it's not a story at all. And I think that's one of the things we've got to remember as we get into summer time frame is, you know, it's inevitable that we'll get into a hot and dry uh, period you know, maybe the market isn't uh, super excited about it right up front, just simply due to the fact we've got so much subsoil moisture in a lot of areas that we haven't for the last two to three years. And so, you know, I think that there's, you know, there's several different things to think about here. That's one thing, of course, I always think about pasture situations, because I do think that that could certainly have an impact on the cattle market if we talk about that later. But bottom line is the drought's pretty much gone. Why do you say it's inevitable that you run into a hot and dry period? It just seems like you always do. You always have at least a week or two, you know, where people get a little sketchy or whatnot. I'm not saying it's going to happen. It's just you typically have some sort of a weather market. And I do think, you know, we were trying to evolve a weather market in the spring, you know, with a wet, uh, wet spring, late planting type situation that played out for maybe uh, 10 days to two weeks. You know, but that's gone. That's over with, as we uh, have witnessed here this week. Uh, now, the only thing, I guess, from a weather standpoint that you would expect uh, could happen is, hey, maybe we get a little bit warm and dry later on. So has the corn market erased a lot of its recent gains just because we've made planting progress and now that story is behind us? And now we've got to look at weather moving forward, which for the moment is is wet. So is is wet bearish now? I would think so. You know, I mean, uh, tomorrow's I do, June. So I do think another thing that has hurt us, for instance, this week, as we've as we've realized the corn plant, uh, corn planting is is uh, approaching, you know, being done here in the next uh, week to ten days. You know, the wheat market hasn't helped us out this week, and so I think that that's part of the reason that the markets have fallen as well. But I think you make a great point. From this point forward, it's going to be really hard for any sort of a massive rain event to be looked at as anything other than positive, unless it, of course, is extremely widespread with wind and, you know, uh, derecho type uh, situation. I just think any sort of moisture is going to be looked at as, uh, as bearish. Is there going to be a lot of prevent plant? I don't know about a lot. I think there'll be a little more prevent plant in highly productive areas than what we've seen. I do think there might be some in Iowa, just from what I've been here. I don't think it's going to be widespread. I do think that it'll play in, though. Uh, it's probably going to be a little bit more, of course, than what you see in a dry year. And so maybe it will catch the market a little bit. But I think you and I both agree that it seemed like those March numbers on planning uh, uh, seem a little bit low. Um, I kind of think that maybe the trend was that we could have seen a little a little more corn acres planted there in June, uh, as far as the planted acreage report goes. So, you know, if that's the case and uh, prevent plants up a little bit, maybe it's a wash. There's already a yield debate. People are already talking about it. What's the corn yield going to be? Um, I taped U.S. Farm Report with Tyne yesterday, and we were talking about this. And uh, I guess the question was like, uh, there were two points that I made. I said, one, you know, you can't predict the yield in May. Like, that's a crazy thing to do. If, if you're to say the yield's going to be 176 on May 31st, that's crazy. But is it crazy to say that, hey, maybe the top end has been removed, maybe 181 is off the table, or is that even, is, is even that crazy to say? That's a tough one. Here's what I think, uh, and I'll get to, I'll answer your question, hopefully. But I do think, uh, you know, crop conditions are going to come out of the gate pretty strong. 
Okay. I think a lot of folks are going to say, Hey, there's going to be a little bit of very poor, of course, where, where, where people had way too much uh, moisture, but boy, I talked to a lot of folks and uh, they seem to say, Hey, considering all things, my crop looks pretty darn good. So I think crop conditions will be good. Your spring, sins if you will like uh, compaction uh, playing into wet soil those things show up later in the year okay so uh, do i think the top end's been taken off yeah probably i don't see a 181 personally but can you see a 177 to 179 still yeah i, I believe that that's still possible uh, i think that last year with the kind of weather you had uh you know and you still ended up with a couple of well-time rain events and had uh, a record type yield you can see the same thing again happen this year, I believe so. Just because we were a little bit later planning doesn't mean uh, that we can't. Let's run through some weather real quick. We do have an active radar this morning. You've got rains over South Dakota, parts of Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, kind of scattered uh, a little bit over Minnesota, Iowa. Next five days is is pretty wet for a lot of areas, but it's it's the coverage isn't it, it's widespread, but it's not. There's pockets that'll be dry, like you look at that pocket of Central Iowa, and again, these are just forecasts. They're not always accurate. Um, this stuff in Illinois and further east is going to be early next week. I think more like Monday, Tuesday ish. And then, um, you know, the stuff over North Dakota, South Dakota is going to be more uh, current. So we've still got kind of a wet uh, pattern here. Some traders believe that summer heat could send commodity prices higher. Given that the first four months of this year have been the warmest in 175 years, there's a chance that 2024 could end up being the hottest year on record. Due to this, some analysts and traders believe that natural gas and electric and electricity prices will soar as air conditioning use ramps up. There's also an increased chance of blackouts. Wheat futures have risen to their highest level since July and could possibly rise further due to concerns over a supply shortage. Unfavorable growing conditions in Russia and the potential for a worsening U.S. drought could have a negative impact on production. I threw this in this morning because it's a positive commodity story. And hey, we're we're rooting for you, right? Um, there's some stuff in here that I like and some that I don't. This is some Euro model data regarding temperatures. And um, I think that most of the data is in agreement that, yeah, this is going to be like, on average, the warmest year that you've seen in the last 150 years or something like that. It's, it's been that way so far for the first four months. But when it comes to crop production, Matt, like if we're on average, one degree warmer than we were last year does that have any implication at all it might mean yields are better as long as you've got some moisture i mean joe you want heat uh you want heat for corn crop you just don't want to have 80 degrees uh you know overnight you don't want to have uh 90 90 plus degrees for several days in a row those are things you don't want to see on a corn crop or those things going to happen in a summer like this when you're one degree above normal you know, I think it's anybody's guess. The timing of those types of situations, uh, whether it's during pollination, whether it's during grain fill. But I would say if you asked me, would you rather have a warmer summer or a cooler summer? Uh, I'd rather have a warmer summer as long as I've got no more, uh, not, uh, enough moisture to get myself through. And so, I, boy, I don't know. I'm not here's, so sure that it means that yields are going to be below trend. Yeah, I don't think it's much. Uh, here's electricity prices. This is electricity per kilowatt hour in the U.S. city average. Uh, they're up 29% from your pre-COVID levels, and everything changed after COVID, of course. So that's that's for real. Here's wheat, and, and wheat is interesting. They had a crappy version of this chart in the Bloomberg article, and I made a better one. Um, so wheat, global wheat, ending stocks to use. It's going to be the tightest since 2014, according to USDA projections. But as I said yesterday, these USDA projections – they're probably still too high with the Russian crop. They're not accounting for Indian imports. So the wheat situation is awfully tight. And it's like, it's, it feels like it's changing in real time. Yeah, I mean, it continues to tighten up over the last few yeah. years. Uh, you know, I've talked about this a lot in the last few years. You, you know, you had a 50% plus uh, world stocks to use ratio for a long time. Yeah. You know, and you continue to just kind of whittle that down. I call it kind of a just-in-time delivery type situation. You know, the issue with that, of course, is, uh, you know, whenever you have a Russia, uh, a Russian production issue on top of tightening world stocks, you know, all of a sudden you get people just a little bit frenzied. So, you know, uh, uh, it, certainly it's been good for the big three, if you will. Wheat's kind of led us out of the doldrums. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, does it have potential on down the road? Oh, maybe. You know, I'm a little hesitant to get super friendly wheat in here but uh, by all means tightening stocks aren't going to do anything uh, you know to hurt the prices in my opinion yeah in reality when when and if usda decides to 
recognize the Russia situation and also the India situation. That could be a, a big swing on the balance sheet, and this thing could get a lot tighter. Here's natural gas, which they mentioned, and I don't see anything to be concerned about here. You're at like pre-COVID levels. It's dirt cheap. Um, it can rally quickly, though. We've seen that in the past. It appears that very little ethanol will qualify for sustainable aviation fuel tax credits. According to a review of USDA data by Reuters, barely any U.S. corn farmers use all three climate smart practices needed to qualify for the subsidies. The Biden administration's new pilot program for SAF tax credits requires farmers to implement no-till farming, efficient fertilizer use, and the planting of cover crops. The pilot program applies to ethanol produced this year and next year. A new program will be developed in 2025, and there is a chance that it could be less restrictive. Although very little ethanol will be eligible for SAF tax credits, the USDA believes the rule is a milestone since it recognizes farmers' ability uh, to climate, uh, excuse me, to combat climate change. A couple of things here. So this is kind of an update on an old story. Um, Brian Jennings is the CEO of the American Coalition for Ethanol. He said this, I have not had a single ethanol producer member contact me and say, we're going to meet the climate smart agricultural requirements. So nobody's going to meet this thing. The bigger thing is that this 40B, which they came out with, um, is, is really only good to the end of the year. And they haven't given us anything on 45Z, which is what's going to be in effect uh, January 1st. So we're still left just wondering what this is going to be. Vilsack said there was going to be something out on 45Z two weeks ago. It hasn't been out. So um, again, I'll go back to this. You guys need to push your trade groups and your checkoff dollars or whoever toward uh, guidance on 45Z because you need it like right now. Yeah, there's you need, no it, doubt. You needed it three months ago or or more than that. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I mean, I, talking to growers, you know, are, are you going to do the big three things? You know, most people are saying that, nah, but I don't know that it's going to be worth it. I mean, if they would start talking numbers uh, of a little more substance you know i believe people might show some more interest but there's just too many unknowns here you know and then so do you change your your farming practices if you will you know some folks uh, depending on their soil types you know are going to tell you that they're going to have um, you know a pretty tough time making uh, cover crops work uh, whereas others they thrive you know it, it's it's a there's a big difference even on our farm we've got uh, you know some huge disparities and i think that uh, cover crops have worked much better on on some farms and what they were to others so i i don't know uh, we need to be pushing for it though because without renewable fuels we could have you know a glut uh, uh an absolute glut especially as south america just continues ramp up production yeah i think we're just we're sitting and waiting on government guidance which is never it's never a good place to be because you know it's going to be slow u.s ethanol production increased last week Weekly output of 1.07 million barrels was up 4.8% on the week and up 8.6% versus the same week last year. Ethanol stocks were pegged at 23.2 million barrels. The print was down 4.2% compared to the previous week, but up 5.3% compared to the same week last year. Implied gasoline demand was down 1.8% compared to the previous week and down 3.1% versus the same week last year. On average, over the last four weeks, implied U.S. gasoline demand is down marginally versus the same period last year. I've got nothing but nice things to say about corn demand. Um, ethanol production is good. Um, export pricing is competitive. U.S. export pricing is competitive versus just about anybody else in the world right now. Um, I think export business is going to be good. So, I mean, the corn, corn doesn't really have a demand problem like soybeans does. No, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I don't know that we're going to outdo, for instance, uh, the way that the USDA raised you know, demand uh, on the May report. I mean, that was uh, that was maybe a little bit bigger adjustment than I thought they would make. Yeah. Uh, certainly uh, was was welcome. Uh, but I do think that um, I'm like you. I mean, corn demand is is responded. You know, to a little yeah. bit cheaper prices than what we've seen over the last couple of years. Whereas soybean demand, it just pretty much stinks right now. So I've got a lot more concerns. I think whenever it comes to uh, uh, you know soybeans, I guess the same thing you're saying. I mean, I just I don't know. I'm, I'm when we talk about that. soybean demand being bad we're talking specifically about exports crush has been good i mean we had one bad yeah. month of, of crush numbers 
but exports are bad and the new crop book of export sales for soybeans is especially bad um china still hasn't existed. booked a single cargo it's it's the worst book in 20 years um, that's the problem is, is export demand for U.S. soybeans. Moderna's shares continue to climb. Shares rose th- shares rose 2.7% on Thursday to $151.93. The rise was attributed to the U.S. government closing in on a deal to fund a late stage trial of Moderna's mRNA bird flu vaccine. The funding could total tens of millions of dollars and be available as soon as next month. Moderna shares have increased by 40% since the bird flu was first detected in a Texas dairy worker at the end of March. Also on Thursday, another confirmed case of the bird flu was reported in a dairy worker in Michigan. Since the outbreak first began in late March, three total human cases have been confirmed. Okay, so we know that this uh, hurt the cattle market for a day or two pretty badly. But um, other than that, Matt, what are your thoughts on the bird flu situation as it relates to cattle or otherwise? Uh, I I don't expect there to be a much greater impact than what we've already seen. It's my personal opinion. Okay, Um, you know, it obviously seems fairly confined. I think people are trying to work to you know, if you identify it, uh, to, to be able to address the situation rather quickly. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's, I mean, the first part of this with Moderna, I think is very interesting, you know, uh, uh, but I, I just leave it at that. (laughs) Yeah. I know a lot of people have a lot to say about this. The fear right now is that, um, it, it turns into a human to human transmission thing, which it has not in these, uh, recent strains that they found. But if that does happen, it's a game changer. Um, for a lot of things, not just the cattle market, like the economy. I mean, the whole world, Mm -hmm. who knows? Uh, What did cattle do yesterday? Uh, They were lower. Feeders were an average of 78 cents lower. Live cattle were an average of 75 cents lower. Uh, Box beef continues to inch higher. Choice rose to its highest level yesterday since September of last year at 314.04. That was up 42 cents. And select end of the day at 302.52. That was up four cents. All right. So is it just a pullback? Just a pullback? I got to think so. Fundamentally, it still still looks pretty good to me. You know, if you, if you could hold the equities markets together through the end of the year, I think you'll see higher prices. Outside markets on Friday, guys, uh, U.S. dollars about flat. Stocks are off a little bit. Bonds are about flat. Crude oil is also about flat. So pretty quiet. 77.90 in the July WTI. Have a great weekend, everybody. Matt, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you on Monday.